Welcome everyone. We're, I guess we're going to dive into things. Um, we will um, basically have our two presentations, um, you know, 20 minute presentation, another 20 minute presentation, and then 20 minutes for question and answer. Um, we really want to get into the discussion as much as possible. So uh, without, uh, you know, uh, any more preface than that, we'll get into things. Um, and Sina, why don't uh, you start? Hi, everybody. My name is Sina Baram. I'm the principal at Prime Access Consulting. And together with Corey, I very much enjoy working on inclusive design and accessibility across the cultural sector. It's great to be here virtually with everybody. And uh, I'm Corey Timpson. Um, and uh, if you don't know me, I'm a consultant who works uh, in the museum field. I've been working in the field since 2000. I was the uh, project director for the startup and design build of the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. And in the last three years, um, Sina and I have been working in partnership with a number of different clients uh, about, uh, in Asia, North America, and Europe, um, looking at multi-sensory uh, experience design through our inclusive design and accessibility methodology. The presentation that we're giving today is um, sort of a, a follow-up, not sort of, is very much a follow-up um, to last year's presentation that we gave on multi-sensory uh, experience design and the surfacing of inclusive design and accessibility affordances um, within these scenarios of multi-sensory uh, design. So um, obviously this year has been a bit of a different uh, year than any of us were expecting. So we thought it was really important that we looked at uh, what we had discussed uh, at last year's session uh, in San Diego and figured out, you know, what does that mean in, in today's reality? So that's what we're going to get into. Can I just get a verbal confirmation that my slide is shared and that someone saw it switch. Yes, Corey, it's advancing. Thank you. So um, a few slides just as a bit of a recap um, from last year and to ensure that you know we're all on the same page going forward. Um, we really think about our approach to uh, inclusive design and accessibility as, as this ethos. Um, uh, this is in a nutshell what our methodology is. And the idea here is whether we're designing an exhibition or working on the design of an exhibition or a public program or an educational program or an event, or we're writing a policy or developing something uh, operational, um, we really think about what are the vectors of human difference and how do we accommodate all of those vectors at the outset um, rather than design and develop something and then figure out later down our development path that we have to try and make it accessible or change it. And that's the scenario we're always trying to uh, avoid there are very practical implications around cost and budget and schedule and all of these things, but really around compromising what our intentions are. And that's what we want to avoid. So um, I just as a recap, when we're talking through our examples coming up, um, this is our ethos. Um, consider consideration of all vectors of human difference. Um, we also think about the ecosystem of which each and every one of us is a part of. So in today's day and age, um, people exist within both physical and digital spaces concurrently. Everyone's walking around or the vast majority of people with a mobile device in their pocket that holds more computing power than all of NASA had in 1969. And that is an important asset for us to think about when we're thinking about what that experience design is, what the expectations of our visitors are, um, what our audience is expecting, and to not have that as being just a fundamental principle, um, you know, would set us up to be, you know, somewhere between ineffective to, to inefficient. So we must consider both of these spaces and not do that in isolation, but think of them as a true ecosystem. Um, the premise that we, uh, start from with any of our work is that we have intentions as designers, as developers, as museologists, as museum professionals, we have these intentions. Our audience also has intentions. And when those intentions don't line up, when they're mismatched, that's when we create barriers. So we wanna resolve any mismatch um, that may happen between what our intentions are as museum professionals, as people who are designing, developing, creating experiences for others and what the expectations are of those people coming in. We could do a whole deck and presentation on front-end evaluation and what that means and how inclusive design and accessibility fits into that. But the principal idea here is to recognize that this is our premise and to keep this front of mind. The characteristics of our approach and again, if you want to see examples of these, like go back and check out last year's deck, we're not going to sort of re-go through all those things. But when we're thinking about what we're doing, um, the characteristics that are common amongst the projects we work on are mixed interaction design scenarios, analog and digital blends, stylistic variety, 
immersion, multi-sensory affordances, and multiple modalities of delivery. And uh, last year's deck gets really into the weeds on these things. But the idea here is that we want to have as many opportunities uh, for entry into content and experience as possible for as many people as possible. And these characteristics demonstrate that this is the consistency that we you know, strive for. The outcomes of our approach, though, are accessibility, interoperability with systems and um, exhibition kits, scalability, deeper and broader engagement across different audience demographics, and a greater return on investment or the strategic or performance indicators of the organization. These are all outcomes. And I think the important point to highlight here is that our approach is an inclusive design methodology and accessibility is an outcome of that approach along with these other outcomes. Entering 2020 and the pandemic. So then the, the pandemic hits, right? And I think we have a, a few things that we're, we're all very much concerned with, with respect to uh, the new world, the new normal that we find ourselves in. Um, you know, first is around transmission, right? Just being, being safe, making sure that we're really considering uh, how that works within environments. There's a lot of concern around touch, for example, and also social distancing and how to do this in, uh, in, in a safe manner. Right. Uh, but also there's comfort, right? Not only the comfort of the visitor and feeling comfortable, feeling safe to come to the museum, uh, perhaps in smaller groups or as things are relaxed in terms of quarantine, etc. But also the comfort of the staff, the comfort of the organization to provide this safe environment. Now, when we're considering these two things, it's also important to, to move to sustainability, right? Like, are we doing things that are going to be sustainable during this effort, whether it is mitigations, whether it is, for example, how we are treating touch and other affordances, but then also, are we making smart and deliberate decisions right now that won't cost us a lot a year from now, two years from now, three years from now? And this is really important because what we don't want to do is take uh, excessive actions right now that then will cost us a great deal to get back to baseline uh, a few years into the future. And lastly, barriers, right? Th thinking about the mitigations that we're putting in place, thinking about the policies that we're following, thinking about the ways that we're reacting to the pandemic, we want to be very conscious that there are steps that need to be taken to preserve safety, sustainability, and comfort, but also we don't wish to do so in such a way that just further introduces barriers and obstacles to inclusion and access. So what are some, uh, you know, what, what does success look like when we talk about these uh, mitigations? And if for us, success looks like a combination of solutions. It's not just one tactic. It's not just social distancing. It's not just uh, closing everything down. We really view this as a multifaceted and deliberate and considered approach. So we believe that the solution uh, to ensuring inclusive access, it honestly has not changed. A lot of the things we've been talking about are very much similar to what we now have to do for the pandemic. Somebody may not be able to touch something and before it might've been because of a difference of ability. Now it's because we're all in that group for safety considerations. Inclusive design still delivers on these uh, very important objectives. Um, so let's take a look at some, some simple uh, interventions that uh, we thought are, were pretty interesting right now. So the first one is these, uh, these styluses, or styli, I suppose is the plural, um, where you can actuate a touch screen uh, or capacitive touch display, but do so without uh, touching it with your, your, your hands. Uh, there's various forms of these. We just have a photo of one of them on the screen now, which is one made from recycled paper, and they're pretty inexpensive. Uh, I believe they're 15 cents each, uh, but there's reusable ones that can also be sanitized as well. Um, the next one are these finger cots. Um, so they're these covers for your finger. By, by way of visual description, it basically looks like a finger condom, for lack of a better uh, description of what that is. And it covers your finger, but allows you to still actuate a touch screen while minimizing spread. Again, uh, these exist in both, uh, in both uh, reusable, and, uh, sanitizable, and also disposable uh, uh, manners. And the photo that we see here is uh, someone actuating a touch screen and iPhone uh, with these finger cots on their thumbs. 
And then lastly, it's human interaction, right? And Corey is, is fond of very much uh, quoting that the most, uh, you know, most interactivity or most interactive experience you'll ever uh, have is a conversation. And we fundamentally believe that humans are at the heart of the practice. That's what we do. And so uh, not only uh, taking advantage of this in terms of having uh, staff be mitigations for uh, actuating touch screens or uh, uh, you know, modifying a display, but also in terms of providing that level of access. So making sure that we rely on those soft tactics where people can provide these accessibility affordances as well. Continuing on, um, you know, you would have noted in our, in our presentation last year or over the years, this idea of mobile integration and you know, back to that digital, physical, uh, coexisting, concurrent spheres of interactivity um, within the ecosystem. You know, the idea of integrating the mobile device into the digital uh, landscape within uh, your programming um, provides a great opportunity to get around some of the the um, you know hurdles that we have to achieve right now. So this idea of mobile integration, um, not quite the same as porting to mobile. Um, but certainly that's another opportunity, you know, the use of, of uh, HTML or web technology and galleries at kiosks and stuff like that, you know, is it a, is it a big leap to move that stuff to mobile device um, or is it a short step? You know, these things can be considered if there is, uh, you know, intellectual property or licensing issues around content such that it can only be presented in the gallery. Well, that could be geofenced, you know, through the use of the of the, the museum Wi-Fi, et cetera. So mobile integration um, provides uh, a substantial amount of affordances just in general, but certainly uh, of increased relevance uh, in today's uh, scenario. And just and a mobile quick note, uh, just, uh, just a quick note, go ahead, tons go ahead. of assistive yeah. technology exists on people's mobile devices. So there's also an opportunity for enhancing inclusion with respect to mobile. Go, go ahead. Yeah, I should describe the screenshot here is from an exhibition that we produced um, whereby visitors were taking in a large, um, you know, physical installation and we created a reflection wall for this installation, which was called the witness blanket. Um, this was both available on iPads in gallery as well as online. So the remote audience could participate and the aggregation of responses by in gallery and online participants um, allowed this dialogue to take place and be projected on the wall in gallery as well as on a website. So in this case, you know, if that installation was being presented right now, um, you know, just removing the iPads from in gallery and ensuring that people understood they could use their mobile device in the same uh, fashion would get around, um, you know, that ability and, to, and it would be all accessible um, given the adaptive technology in the mobile device. Um, mobile controllers are another um, asset. So this is a company called FreeTouch um, that uh, allows the mobile device to be used basically as a mouse. Um, it doesn't require an app. Um, you can look them up and you know they're, they're one of many products like this, um, but these are things that could be explored as well that would mitigate against uh, some of the issues. I think this is less of a mitigation, more of just a please do this. Um, please surface this information on your website. Um, we're featuring the Corning Museum of Glass here because they have a pretty extensive amount of information about what visitors can expect. So just in terms of general inclusive design practices, you will hear Sina and I speaking all the time about please surface information on the website to manage expectations before people get on site. Um, here they're, they've done that with that little we're open, keeping everyone safe is our idea of a class act. When you click that button, you are brought to a section of the website that literally details everything that they're, they're doing, what the expectations are um, as you arrive, and also what the expectations are of the museum on the part of the visitors um, to you know, wear masks and social distance, et cetera. So um, you know, please surface this information as prominently um, as you can. And then we have some examples. Oh, go, go. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, we have some examples now that we want to show um, that really follow our approach to inclusive design and accessibility. And, um, you know, the kicker on these is that, um, you know, they, they seem even more relevant today than when we first worked on these projects.
Yeah, ex exactly. I mean, for example, the Warhol example that we're showing now, we've talked about before with respect to tactile reproductions. But the thing to note is that the material that these are made out of was actually specifically designed to be geometrically inert and felt a lot, but also easy to disinfect. It's, it's called acetal. Um, and the, the idea there is that uh, the audio descriptions, the visual descriptions, the scripts for all of those, if folks prefer to read it in text versus audio, all of that is surfaced on the mobile device. And you don't even actually uh, have to uh, be at the physical reproduction, but you can be. And then we can use those same mitigations that we talked about earlier, such as someone coming by and disinfecting the surface so that it can still be an inclusive experience. And you can use your mobile device to access that information. Corey? Yep. Um, another example is um, we used augmented reality um, for artifact exploration. So we had these apietas, which were in a conditioned environment uh, in an artifact case behind glass under low lighting condition with a microclimate machine um, providing the environmental control. And we wanted to um, provide both supplemental information, but also make the artifact more accessible. Um, so we developed uh, an, IO, an app for iOS, which uh, image recognized uh, the artifact and allowed visitors the opportunity to explore the details of the artifact in, well, in greater detail. <laughs> and, um, but also to be able to have the content accessible through text-to-speech. So um, in this case, um, we were all, oh, and uh, it, yeah, sorry. In this case, um, not only does the opportunity provide greater access um, to, uh, you know, the, the visitors that are in the gallery, but it provides remote access as well and um, it really provides the multi-sensory affordances that we're talking about. So rather than something just being a visual um, you know, con uh, experience, it's now also uh, an audio experience as well. And then um, finally, um, this was uh, the last exhibition that I produced at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights before leaving there. It was on Nelson Mandela. And um, what you see in the background of the image is a collection of picket signs with um, protest posters on them. Three of those uh, protest posters are actually blanks and there's project projection that's masked um, that allows people to create their own posters and add them to the, the composition of that installation. And uh, we developed it specifically through an iOS app um, in order to leverage the accessibility components of the iOS. So while you could participate in gallery by producing your own poster, you can also go online and you can do this right now. The exhibition is being presented in uh, Texas right now. Um, you could go and create your own poster uh, through, it's actually a responsive website. It's not even an app. You can see postersforfreedom.ca is the URL. Um, and you can have your poster projected in gallery within that setting. Um, but the intention here was originally to make it as accessible as possible, make the experience inclusive. And we're talking about accessibility, not only about ability and disability, but in terms of remote audience engagement, as well as on-site audience. So this is just another one where, you know, if you wanted to not have this touch screen running in the gallery, then you could simply have people using their mobile devices. So concluding with a few final thoughts, the, the first one is that, uh, you know, as we've, we've said uh, for a long while now, inclusive multi-sensory design may, you know, it surfaces affordances that may be critical for one audience, but they're augmentative, they are assistive, they are inclusive, they are helpful for many audiences. That is, that is really the point of all. Right, And so when we consider the ecosystem, there's a multitude of tactics that can be applied across all of these facets that can both be inclusive and not introduce barriers, but also keep people safe. Um, you know, the, the pandemic has caused uh, a great deal of disruption. I think that's a pretty fair uh, statement to, to make. Uh, but one of the outputs of this disruption is a rather forced uh, broad adoption and uh, increase in digital literacy and our usage of these, uh, of these modalities. So what we wanna do is we don't wanna lose these wins, right? We're doing things like visual description tours over uh, Zoom. We're seeing sign language uh, content being promoted over digital platforms. These are amazing wins that we don't want to lose track of when we do go back because 
you know, while there's been a great deal of negative effects, and I think we're all unfortunately deeply familiar with those, there have been a few wins in terms of access that we don't want to lose. And lastly, you know, we've been doing this all along. When we think of inclusive design and accessibility, and we think about considering this entire vector of human difference, there are people who cannot touch, there are people who cannot see, there are people who may not be able to use the stairs either permanently or that day. Well, some of us are now in a group that we didn't find ourselves in, right? Some of us are now, a lot of us are in a group where we can't touch things. But if we're following an inclusive design methodology, we're already addressing that. We're already programming for that. We're already budgeting for that. And so just a reminder for all of us that inclusive design is not just about access, but it is really about all of these things so that when something like a pandemic hits, we're able to pivot in an appropriate way because we've already taken those considerations uh, at heart and into, you know, into, into, our, into our policies. And then I think we'll turn it over to Lauren. And then we'll do group questions at the end. Okay, great. Thanks, Dina. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. And then, Corey, I'm going to ask you for a verbal confirmation that it's advancing too. Um, great. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, Cheryl, do you want to start by introducing yourself? Sure, one moment. I am. Okay. I am an independent scholar and I research and develop multi-sensory museum experiences that are accessible to everyone regardless of their visual acuity. I earned my PhD in anthropology from the University of New Mexico and museum collections were essential for that work. Uh, I noticed some diversity issues as I went through my education and completion of my degree. And so consequently, I also mentor and teach high school students in science programs run by the National Federation of the Blind. Great, uh, thanks Cheryl. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Lauren Race. I'm an accessibility designer and researcher at the NYU Ability Project. Uh, so the NYU Ability Project is an interdisciplinary research space uh, dedicated to the intersection of technology and disability. And I work in the design lab there. So what I do is I design and I evaluate accessible educational tools in formal and informal settings. Uh, my current research is partnering with the Intrepid Museum in New York City to develop more accessible museum experiences uh, funded by an IMLS grant. I have my BFA in communications design with a minor in art history from Pratt Institute. And I also have my master's from NYU's interactive telecommunications program, otherwise known as ITP, which is a very strange little interactive tech and art program. Um, so today, Cheryl and I are gonna be talking about designing, producing and preserving accessible touch objects for museums. So Corey, did my slide advance? Yep, you're good. Great, okay, thanks. Okay, cool, so, but first I really wanna talk about the motivation for this work. Um, you know, at the Ability Project, we do a lot of these little research studies, um, but it's always best to kind of define what that problem area is first. So, uh, you know, we all learn through multimodal sensing. I know Sina kind of mentioned that earlier. Um, some of us learn best through sight, some of us learn best through hearing, and some of us learn best through tactile exploration or touch. Um, yet, unfortunately, a lot of information at museums and historic sites is presented visually. Um, museums are leaders in large-scale information presentation. Um, yet, we found a statistic from the National Endowment of the Arts that said that less than 7% of Americans with disabilities, including adults who are blind or low vision, visited museums in 2015. And so these spaces are supported by federal and state funding uh, and the buildings must meet the requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, but the ADA requirements mostly address physical accessibility challenges. So, you know, it's common for artifacts to be kept under glass or roped off or displayed next to a do not touch sign, making museums less accessible. So some information can be accessed digitally with like kiosks or mobile devices, but only if those experiences are designed to be inclusive. Uh, when museums do offer tactile experiences, they commonly use our, what are called touch objects. So touch objects for those who are new to them are artifacts that are rendered tactile through interpretation. And they can be on like the low fidelity end of the spectrum where their content and production are further away from accurately 
representing an original artifact, or they can be on the high fidelity end of the spectrum where their content and production is closer to accurately representing an original artifact. So these touch objects are critical to museums. And so for accessibility, we need to be considering all senses when presenting information at them, including touch. So the images on this slide show a relief sculpture of 13 women holding pottery and is displayed behind glass at the Hubei Museum in China. Um, and a sign on the table in the museum gallery reads, please do not touch, thank you. And in the background is a dark green wall displaying paintings. Unfortunately, uh, there are some looming threats to touch objects. Um, there were already budget cuts to accessibility programming before COVID. Uh, not to mention there's this growing trend where we're leaning towards representing content digitally. And COVID has only accelerated these issues. Um, you know, some museums have responded to COVID by closing hands-on exhibits with tactile components for safety reasons. Um, you know, for example, the Please Touch Museum in Philadelphia extended its closure well into 2021. The problem with this is by eliminating tactile experiences, we exclude an entire population of people who learn best through touch. So I urge folks today to keep thinking about tactile experiences in museums, even as we lean towards making things digital. Um, so the image on this slide shows three women standing around a large bronze sculpture in a museum, wearing latex gloves and touching its structure. So knowing that touch objects were threatened, we wanted to conduct research to figure out which were worth saving in the future. You know, which, which are worth spending the most time and money on if we're gonna save um, a group of them. So we investigated this problem through the lens of art museums and historic sites where touch experiences are particularly fragile and have low adoption rates. And we considered, uh, we conducted interviews with 15 museum access specialists across the United States and when we discovered that all of them identified as sighted, we considered their answers with six accessibility experts who identified as blind or low vision. And our interviews with the 15 sighted museum access professionals and the opinions of the six accessibility experts who identified as blind or low vision led to four findings. So the first finding is that tactile ex uh, experiences must be preserved. Um, though some experts preferred some type of touch, touch objects more than others, they didn't want any of them to disappear. Um, one of the ex accessibility experts told us, quote, I just want there to be more, more opportunities to touch objects, and it's always been an uphill struggle, end quote. The second finding is that they should be consistently created. So given the detailed guidelines for creating accessible exhibit design at places like the Smithsonian, and the history of tactile graphic design guidelines with organizations like the Braille Authority of North America, we were really surprised to find a lack of design guidelines for touch objects. Um, while some of this work is done by experts, we were also surprised how many touch objects are created by interns with limited accessibility or fabrication experience. Um, these interns are working without any guidelines and they frequently create touch objects that are not discernible to visitors yet are still included in touch tours. Um, the third finding is that they read infantile when DIY'd or poorly crafted. So poorly crafted touch objects create inequity for visitors who are blind or low vision who are paying the same admission price as sighted visitors to interact with objects that feel less valuable. Um, one of the blind or low vision accessibility experts quoted a client's first reaction to their DIY touch objects, um, quote, wow, this is great looking at all the touch, touchable here, things here for kids, end quote. And then finally, the fourth finding was that they cannot be replaced by audio uh, using verbal description or digital only solutions. So touchless experiences like listening to audio of a verbal description are received secondhand. So they're filtered through the biases of whoever described that artifact. Um, description can enhance tactile experiences and they often do, but it's still not a replacement for touch. Uh, one of the accessibility experts told us, quote, we walked around the gallery and a docent described paintings. And my comment was, I might as well have stayed home, end quote. The images on this slide show different types of touch objects 
commonly used by museums. The first one is a miniature touch object made with gold foil of a modern sculpture. The sculpture is comprised of interlocking segments of circles that extend out to create a 3D shape. Uh, the second image shows a gallery patron standing before a wooden bowl on a kiosk, reaching their left arm out to touch the rim while holding a white cane in their right hand. The third image shows a museum access professional holding a small purchase model of an airplane for a visitor to touch. The model is red, white, and blue with a star emblem near the nose of the airplane. Um, and then the fourth image shows a visitor interacting with a foul material sample of a carpet tile that has a rib structure and the fibers are compo uh, composed primarily of cashmere goat hair. Uh, the fifth image shows a visitor touching a printed tactile graphic of a wrought iron screen depicting a muse with a violin. And the gold plated figure at the center stands on rolling hills while concentric rings and rectangular shapes surround the scene. Uh, and then finally, the, the last image shows a museum visitor holding a four inch wide 3D print of a T-Rex skull with its mouth open bearing its teeth uh, and it's cream colored and it's made of plastic. Um, so now I want to turn it over to Cheryl Fogelhatch, who's going to be taking you through our recommendations for museums based on our findings. Thank you very much, Lauren. So today I'm going to talk about ways to preserve tactile access in spite of COVID. I will highlight my other projects and many of these support Lauren's interview findings. People are problem, problem solving in the moment. When the pandemic began, I had ongoing conversations with tactile artists about ways to safeguard tactile access. Two colleagues, Anne Cunningham and Matt Jesualdi, and myself, identified specific examples drawn from our work that we proposed as models for safe practices during the COVID pandemic. We wrote a blog post about this for the American Alliance of Museums. That is linked to this slide. I will summarize with uh, this quote about it. Quote, we imagine a scenario where visitors could borrow tactile handouts, use them for reference as they tour an exhibit, and then return them to the museums for treatment and later reuse, unquote. So this slide shows examples of the handouts at small scale and large scale. At small scale, the 3D printed replica of a stone spear point can be manipulated with one hand. The attached wooden coin is a QR code that when scanned directs a smartphone to read more information about it, such as that might be found on an exhibit label. A uh, little quick background, these are artifacts found from the Maryland Archaeological and Conservation Laboratory. The QR code coin is printed on a sticker, the wooden coin is added so that it is easily findable. The lanyard keeps the coins attached to the artifact replica. I was concerned about losing the information, you know, as, as these artifact replicas are handled. So that's the background there. At larger scale, people can be encouraged to maintain physical distance as they explore separate tactile panels. This idea is loosely based on an interactive art installation titled Mission to Noctera, created by Matt Jesualdi. That's the other panel handout on the slide here. So Matt incorporated use of antibacterial wipes into the exhibit as the storyline. The storyline is that the puzzles are alien artifacts that must be protected from human germs. So as he explained the process to me, the visitors entered the theater auditorium, they got the storyline. On their way to the puzzle room, they were handed a wipe, and they wiped, and then they entered. So it controlled the flow and it controlled the sanitation of the exhibit with a volume of people coming through. This is Denver Maker Fair 2018. And the link to the blog on the slide shows a link out to a piece about that. Next slide, please. So going to the recommendations, we recommend digital fabrication methods such as 3D printing over poorly designed handcrafted techniques. This slide shows the full set of 3D printed replica stone sphere points from the study uh, prototype design that I mentioned last. Returning to Lauren's interview findings, it is our opinion that digital fabrications are preferred for the accuracy of tactile reproductions. 
This is contrasted with the analog nature of most poorly designed tactile objects. And I step back from Lauren's interview findings one more time to offer one comment about handcrafted objects. In my experience, there are a few highly skilled tactile artists, such as my colleagues, Anne and Matt, who can create actile, excuse me, accurate tactile reproductions. We'll see what the captions do with that. Using handcrafted techniques, these individuals carefully plan and construct their work very carefully, and they account for scale and accuracy. With questions of high fidelity in mind, we ranked different techniques for cost and accuracy in our AM blog post mentioned on the last slide. Another recommendation, due to COVID and safety concerns, we recommend fabricating touch objects from materials that can withstand frequent cleaning. This would favor the acrylic resin used to fabricate the 3D replicas pictured here. However, if I were producing the replica now, I might replace the leather lanyard with a plastic material that can be wiped down if desired. Next slide, please. Fortunately, my colleagues and I are not the only people seeking ways to safely conduct tactile exploration. Here we linked to an international example. Tactile Studio developed a sanitation station for touch objects. I am encouraged by these proposed solutions because the work to preserve tactile access in museum exhibits is ongoing. And there's a link to that post. Next slide, please. So finally, uh, if you want more, because we went through this very quickly, you may connect with us. Follow me on Twitter at Fogelhatch and Lauren at Lauren Race. Or you may check out our websites. Museumsenses.org is mine, and I have links there to the blog post and some other publications. And if you go to laurenrace.com, you get the full version of the paper with, with the details, and it's quite good reading. So thank you very much, and we'll take questions. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks, everybody. Um, so uh, to the team, we have a couple of questions already um, in the Q&A window. Um, and uh, there is a bit of chat that I tried to keep up with um, while we were all doing the presentations. Um, so maybe just the first question was from uh, Kaylin. Uh, what would you suggest for a museum gallery that exhibits almost exclusively paper textual or photographic materials to provide tactile experiences. And I guess we could just take that as a panel. If anyone wants to kick things off. I'll mention one thing, I suppose. Uh, for uh, paper products, it depends on uh, how they are uh, produced and what digital uh, resources you have uh, from their creation. If they are original works that have not been digitized, there's one set of solutions versus another. But there are machines, for example, in uh, one of the exhibits that um, uh, Corey actually mentioned in our talk, one of the activities was a uh, uh, a thermoform machine, essentially, where you can take a paper product and if you reproduce it, uh, you can then run it through the machine and it will turn it into a tactile uh, reproduction. So basically what happens is it swells the ink up and that is just, you know, that's one approach. There's other approaches as well, but just putting that one out there. Yeah, I, did, I actually didn't mention that one. And I think oh, okay. we talked about that one last year. And, but, okay. um, yeah, I would also say too, I think it really depends in terms of the photographic material. Um, you know, we showed the Warhol example, I believe in last year's presentation, we talked about the tactile audio described images that we produced uh, for four different exhibitions at the Human Rights Museum uh, at this point now. Um, there is a little bit of talk, I think, in the chat about 3D printing. Um, any of the materials we used, I think it's important to note, were not 3D printed. Um, they're, they're using a different technology. And, and there was a question that I answered in the Q&A window earlier about what that material was. It's acetal, um, so you can find that there. Um, but that material can be disinfected and cleaned, and it doesn't have the same sort of tactile properties as uh, 3D printing does. So, um, and, and like more of like a sort of almost like, if you will, commercial grade uh, of result that can be handled and dropped, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, so a little bit uh, to do about that. 
I mean, one thing we didn't talk about this time, and, and I'll stop talking in two seconds, is just the idea that, you know, surfacing information tackily, like don't fall down the rabbit hole of thinking that it has to be a one-to-one -one as to how you consume something visually. Um, so like, just keep in mind, we're talking about different modalities and we want to map those modalities, but that doesn't mean that they just like line up, you know, as you might expect. I would like to address the 3D printing, if I may. <laughs> so 3D printing, I reference it a lot because there are so many organizations that are putting up their digital models. With 3D printing, you start with a physical artifact object. You scan it um, with those with expertise. They come up with a digital 3D model, which is fine. And a lot of people do that for their virtual tours on screen. But there's the third step to make it tactile, which means you've got to send it through an STL file and out to a printer. And I can't tell you how many times I find online virtual, you know, somebody's linking to 3D models and, you know, it would be nice to make the tactiles out. And I have another colleague who has been testing, adding digital information to uh, these digital uh, objects that the online courses are using uh, such that you can get your, your information with your uh, 3D printed replica. And I've got links online if you want to explore more about 3D printing resources. Um, maybe we'll move to the next question um, from Ali. Um, I think, Lauren, this one's for you. Did the study address at all using real objects as touch objects? For example, in historic sites, using common objects as touch objects, i.e. not having six butter churns in your collection, but five, and one is a hands-on teaching collection object. Yes. Hey, Allie. Yes, we did. That was one of the categories that we ended up with defining um, was original artifacts, and that was the most preferred by the accessibility experts who are blind or low vision because they were interacting with something really authentic and, um, and really valuable. So, um, so yes, absolutely. The only issue with the COVID situation is some of the uh, objects couldn't handle the rubbing alcohol or couldn't handle those solvents. Um, so in that case, we would recommend doing some type of digital fabrication as a, replicate, as a replication of that thing that was, is delicate. Um, really like the the historic site example in the in the presentation again from last year because we're building off of that one. We did talk about a historic site project where during the restoration there was a lot of sort of discarded material that was being uh, restored or reproduced. And one of the things that we had the team do was keep that material so that we could turn that material uh, into touch objects. Um, you know these original assets that may have been just you know, recycled or, or sent to a landfill actually became touch objects. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, that's a good idea. There's a question from Allison. Um, how to handle the handcrafted tactile objects you do have on display? Taking them out of our exhibit area would be a big loss to the narrative, but I'm pretty sure cleaning them daily, we're closed right now, would speed their deterioration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so again, you know, we found that we, nobody wanted to get rid of touch objects, even if they were DIY. They were just ones that they preferred above others. Um, one thing you could look at is doing some type of more durable um, reproduction of that handcrafted object. Um, I know with tactile graphics, you can do like vacuum forming is a really great way to replicate like hand collaged things. Um, and those are a little bit more durable and could withstand um, those type of solvents and chemicals. Um, you could also look at 3D printing um, a version of it as well, which could withhold um, much more uh, traction and, and, uh, uh, and traffic from museum visitors. I think there's also an opportunity to um, when consider when we make reproductions specifically for touch that depending on what it is that our, our intentions are again and what we're expecting the learning outcomes to be say or the experiential outcomes for the visitor is we don't necessarily have to reproduce the, the object like in one-to-one -one scale or like the entirety of the object. So um, at the Human Rights Museum, there's a large installation called, uh, it's Métis beadwork and it's called an octopus bag. It's the largest one in the world. And it's stunning and it looks super tactile and you know people wanna touch it. But by just creating like a swatch of the beadwork and putting it in front of and saying like, 
you know, feel the beads on this. No one touches the octopus bag anymore. You can produce like thousands of those swatches for the price that it would be to reproduce like one of, of the, the Métis beadworks. But you know, what we're trying to surface is the bead texture and touch. And you can get that from, you know, the little piece and then describe the overall piece as well. So that idea of like mixing the modalities to create a more multi-sensory and inclusive experience. That's Corey, that's actually a really good solution to the material, um, the found material, because that was one of the lower rated tactile objects with, with our data. And we talked to interviewed folks, you know, they're like, well, you know, I know what a flower feels like. I know mm -hmm. it only made sense if it was something they don't normally get to touch outside of a museum. If it was something from their home or something common, it wasn't as exciting. Somebody mentioned touching a moon rock as, as a piece of material, but that's also kind of an artifact too. But that was really exciting for them because that was something they would travel to a museum to go um, visit. So I like the idea of um, augmenting um, these materials with description so that they're not just you know, a lesser than you know, interpretation of whatever the artifact is. And there's, yeah. there is a blend between <clears throat> accuracy and scale, right? So when we when we talk about not needing to reproduce at scale, it doesn't take the onus off of making sure that the, the fidelity and the accuracy is true to the underlying material. In fact, in lots of places, this comes up a lot with tactile maps. If you do a one-to-one -one embossing of most visual maps, it is, uh, uh, to put it kindly, a, an unmitigated disaster tactily, <laughs> right? It's incredibly noisy, it's incredibly dense, and a lot of the visual analogs, and this is, I mean, there's reams of neuroscience literature written on this, they don't translate to touch. On the other hand, there's also tons of literature on how to actually produce good tactile maps. And so it's important to just preserve this design intent and make sure we're using the modality in the way that is best for the, the result we're trying to achieve. Yeah, Sina, exactly. Um, and that's why we were so surprised to find a lack of design guidelines for touch yeah. objects because BANA or the Braille Authority of North America has a, like the Bible of um, mm -hmm. uh, tactile graphic design guidelines. Um, and even like Polly Edmonds book on tactile graphics is a really fantastic resource. There's so many good tactile graphic resources, yeah. but not of just general touch objects. So I think it's a really exciting opportunity for practitioners to really look at yeah. kind of what the Smithsonian has done for guidelines, but applying those to other um, areas as well, such as touch objects. So Great. good thing to look forward to in the future. No, the next question. question. Yeah, questions go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, what about using some sort of hand coverings when interacting with original objects? Has this been done and what and with what results? This might be a good question to study here. again. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren and I talk about this a lot because anecdotally we know it has happened and it and I've been places where I've been asked to put on a, a light glove and you know I do it to touch the sculpture. But we don't think there's a scientific study out there about the effectiveness of gloves and different kinds of gloves and that was amongst the informal conversations that I had this spring gloves kept coming up but we ended up not publishing about gloves because there's nothing out there and we need to have a glove study we need to have controlled numbers of objects kinds of objects kinds of gloves and then conversations and some kind of rating system to get out there um, anecdotally some of the accessibility experts i know say not to use gloves and it is it could impede your your tactile exploration but most folks that I know, and I know I've been of the opinion, is if, if that's what's required, that's what I'll do, you know, to, to touch whatever object. But Lauren and I have been saying we need to do a glove study whenever one can get together in person again. There, there is, there's science on this, right? I mean, like, I, you know, to be blunt about it, there is, a, there are decades of science on maximizing sensitivity uh, through materials. They're called condoms, right? I mean, like, let's just like keep things real for a second here. <laughs> like there is actual science on this, right? And so your fingers are performing the same type of activity. You're trying to protect the skin barrier with the outside world, mm -hmm. the media translation barrier, but you're trying to maximize sensitivity. So like there is, 
there, I, I just want to echo that. that like, there's this absence of, of studies, uh, at least that I've been able to find as well, on, on gloves. But also, like, there's this opportunity to really look at like advances in latex, advances in like mm -hmm. you know fabrics with uh, because especially like you don't have to you know preserve all you know it's different materials, different molecule sizes. You can maximize some sensitivity while still preserving those oils from damaging the underlying mm -hmm. artifact. So I guess you're in on the glove study. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I am in on the glove study. Hand in glove. Hand in glove. That's right. All right, 2021. <laughs> <laughs> if we ever get past this pandemic. Yes. <laughs> uh, question from Liz. Is there a sense that people will be afraid to touch things no matter how useful? Uh, will we be doing messaging, um, messaging and performative public and actual cleaning for some time? I mean, I think that we, we tried to surface this in the deck as about like comfort, you know, irrespective of science, um, you know, what are people just comfortable with? And so I do think there will be people who are afraid to touch things. Yeah. I think like there's a lot that can be done when we talked about human interaction and the human interface as well. When I go to the supermarket and it doesn't matter which one I go to, there's someone at the door who literally wipes down the shopping cart and gives it to me they're doing that, like they're cleaning all the shopping carts, but they're doing that to show me that they yes. are wiping down with disinfectant the shopping cart. And I think like, that's kind of like what we get to with like surfacing information on the website to manage expectations. The demonstration of what you're doing can be just as important as the fact that you're doing it, just to address the, the comfort level of people. Yeah. Yeah, one, one of our experts um, said, I really liked this quote, it was something like, sanitize the people, not the objects. <laughs> and I really liked that as like, um, just like a, a more, um, I don't know, digestible way of approaching this. Um, but I've since kind of shifted to do both, like sanitize the people and the objects. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like Corey said, like have, have, a vis have somebody visibly wiping it down in front of somebody to make them feel comfortable. If they don't feel comfortable touching it, that's okay too. Yeah. It's all about understanding that again, people are on a spectrum of preferences and this is just happens to be one of those preferences. Exactly. Performative um, hygiene. <laughs> yeah. Hygiene that. so theater. Yeah. <laughs> that is beautiful. <laughs> so, um, so we probably have time for a couple more questions. Um, there's a question from Andrea. Hi, Andrea. Um, there are good practices, uh, but not only these. Um, there are good practices, but not only these often are not fully applied, but also intentionally ignored by some decision makers. Any tips for museum professionals to negotiate accessibility layers to projects? Um, I mean, this is a pretty big issue that we have to deal with, I think, all the time is how do we find the salient points of relevancy of what we're talking about in doing based on the people we're speaking with? and you know, Sina and I have very different conversations with the exhibition designers that we work with than we do with the CFOs of large museums. Um, and so, you know, I've told this story before about being on a panel with the COO of Toyota at the International Association of Universal Design and hearing this guy talk about why universal design was so important to Toyota and realize it had nothing to do with, you know, the good story. It had everything to do with shareholders. And so, you know, the salient point there was if they are universal in their design methodology, they can sell more product to more people and they can sell more product to the same people for longer in their lives. So they can increase their target market in breadth and depth. So wrote those notes down and then translated that into the cultural sector as a return on performance indicators, whether it's visitation, repeat visitation, audience demographics, membership, reach, all of these things can be increased through this approach. So that's the kind of conversation we have with CEOs, CFOs and some CEOs, but I think it's a kind of like a super important question you've asked and there isn't one answer. It's like really, I think the one answer would be find the point of relevancy yes. that you can have and establish with the person you're, the audience you're addressing. And if you don't already have one at your institution, start a working group around accessibility and inclusive design. Uh, you know, you may be having lunch with yourself for the first meeting, and that is fine. 
All right, this is just absolutely how it starts. And, and, and you can get some colleagues to join. The more pan-institutional, the better. Get those folks from finance to come in. Uh, you know, we've done all sorts of tactics for this, whether it's uh, like the MCA Chicago doing donuts for descriptions and, you know, spawning visual description projects that way or whatever it is, have these conversations, but then also turn them into something that can eventually link into the governance structure of the museum. Because once you have a collection of people, even if it starts off not with a very clear official mandate, it has a way of then hanging around. So really use that, you know, that thing we all complain about, institutional inertia, use that to your advantage when trying to promote accessibility from within. Yeah, and, and from the digital accessibility side, I do that as well. I always tell my teams, look, like if you don't have buy-in from the C-level folks, yeah. um, I'll motivate people by being like, all right, let's make one goal for this round of iterations on this design. We're gonna do amazing, like contextually relevant CTAs on our buttons on the website. That's what we're gonna focus on. And we're gonna do one thing at a time and then focus on those little, those small wins. Because once people get that feeling of like, that good feeling of, oh, we did something, this is good. You can build on that. So sometimes if you're like, trying to make a big jump into fully accessible whatever you're making, it can be you know, a little uh, intimidating, but just start small, start small and work, work bigger. Um, there's no more questions in the queue. I didn't, um, it was tough to keep up on the chat. I noticed there was one comment about, I think it was in the sort of topic area of vibrotactility or haptics. And just say, I mean, this is another whole topic. Um, certainly things that we like to think about in terms of, you know, expressing things through multiple modalities and for multiple um, modes and, and sensory perceptions. Um, absolutely, vibrotactility can play a really big role, especially with like patterning and, and mapping, you know, um, different sort of aspects to a design intent and an experiential intent of two different patterns. That's, this is a whole area that we can't give, you know, do justice to, um, you know, sensory perceptions like temperature. Um, there's a couple exhibitions that we're working on right now where like the perception of temperature or velocity or um, uh, equilibrium um, are, are being played with. And like that, those are other sensory perceptions that we don't necessarily think about all the time. Um, I will stop talking because there's one more question that just came in. I'm curious what collaboration software like Zoom does for accessibility example, the chat feature. Yeah, so the, the chat is, uh, it can be accessible. The quick rundown just in terms of time is Microsoft Teams and Zoom can be uh, uh, reasonably used with a screen reader. There's been various advances. For example, now you can individually control all of the notifications. So if you're a screen reader user, like for example, I happen to be, uh, I don't have to hear all the messages coming in when I'm giving my talk. I can, you know, you can control that in settings now. All of these platforms, it's critical to understand, have their own accessibility challenges. So make sure when you're using them, use the accessible ones. Zoom and Microsoft Teams are at the top of that list right now. And then reach out to your participants, but don't ask about ability, ask about accommodations, right? Or do you happen to be a screen reader user? Would an accessible version of the slides ahead of time help you? Uh, do you uh, benefit from captions? Something like this, so that you can provide and facilitate uh, an inclusive uh, experience within that platform. So the platform is accessible, but the content on that platform also needs to be accessible. So shout out to MCN for doing the Otter uh, based, Otter AI based uh, captions for these. I will say there was one other question from Dave on uh, Dave Patton on uh, vibrotactile. Did we, Dave? Did we answer your question or not? Um, I just saw that in the chat. I gave like a really simple response, but okay, yes. got it. Happy to happy to geek out about vibrotactile offline. And if there's no more questions, yeah, we can. Um, I'll just draw everyone's attention to Liz Neely's comments about uh, cocktails for captioning, which um, we think is a fantastic idea. Yes. And I'll also, to that. just a shout out to Liz, because I, I, since I first got into the museum field, Liz Neely has been in every single talk I have ever uh, <laughs> given. Uh, and it's just amazing to always uh, see you around. So just thank you for always being such a supporter of inclusivity and accessibility. You're amazing. But also, Sina, she's in everybody's talks always. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> You're not taking this from me. 
Thank you, everybody. I don't know how she does it. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good MCN, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.